I'm Curtis Bowdy and welcome back to the Scope of Science. Now you may have seen this TED Talk from 2012 by Amy Cuddy. It's one of the top 20 most watched TED Talks and it's on power poses. It's this idea that by doing certain stances that show dominance, your brain actually gets rewired to feel more dominant. So if you go into the bathroom before an interview and you do power pose stances, then you will feel more dominant and it will actually increase your testosterone and reduce your cortisol levels and make you less adverse to risk. And then you will go into that interview and you will be more successful. And this is this, this idea that these sorts of power poses and dominant stances can actually change how you live your life and can change how successful you are. In this TED talk on power poses, Cuddy argued that you could significantly change the outcomes in your life using them. That's a very bold statement and it needs to be backed up by evidence. Amy did a study looking at people that were placed in high power poses versus people that were placed in low power poses and they measured certain hormones like testosterone and cortisol before and after and they got them to do dice roll experiments where they would bet money on dice rolls and they looked at how high were their testosterone how high was their cortisol and how adverse to risk were they? How willing were they to take big risks? And in their study, they did find a significant impact on high power poses related to having higher testosterone, lower cortisol, and to be less adverse to risk, to taking more risks. Now, now that's a really neat study with really important findings, but is it accurate? Now that research paper by Amy Cuddy came out in 2010. And it wasn't until five years later that a separate research group came out with another study that tried to do the exact same thing. In the second study, the participants reported that they found that these poses did affect their behaviors and did affect how they felt. But when they actually looked at the saliva samples for their cortisol and for their testosterone, they didn't find any significant change and they didn't see any impact on their risk adversity in this dice betting game. Now, if the results aren't repeatable, what does that say about the original study? Was it just a fluke? Was it manipulation and faked? Or was there something else at play here? Now, this is actually a super important problem in science. We actually call it a replication crisis because we aren't able to replicate most of the studies in science. When we do them again, we find different results. And that is a really big deal. A team of researchers recently looked at 100 different psychology studies that had significant results and they tried to replicate them or find papers that had replicated them. And they found that only 36% of those could be replicated. Now, let's consider another example of this replication crisis. Researchers looked at 53 different landmark studies on preclinical cancer treatments. So it's an important field, and it should be important that these results are reproducible, that someone can go back and do the same study and get the same results. But when they looked at papers that tried to replicate those 53 studies, only 11% were reproducible. So roughly one out of 10 of the time, the science is actually true. Why is this crisis happening? Why is the majority of research not reproducible? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but I'm gonna focus on three. The first one being sample sizes. There's a lot of variability that just isn't captured when you look at a small sample size, and you're more likely to end up with some weird result when you're looking at just a very small subset of the real population. Now, another problem is just sheer desperation. If you're an academic, you have one thing to do, publish or perish. You have to get your results out there and they have to be good. If you don't get good enough papers, you won't get enough funding, you won't get paid, you will starve and it will be bad. If you want to do well, you have to put out a lot of significant and interesting data. There's a lot of pressure that probably leads to a lot of bad practices being followed in research. And thirdly, a lot just goes unreported. A lot of people do studies that don't find significant results 
And so they don't bother publishing those or they have a hard time getting publishers to want to publish those. And so those studies don't get published and they do it again and they do it again and they do it again until they do find significant results and those get published. But that's this weird sampling bias where every time you get a negative result, you don't publish it. And the one time you get a positive result, suddenly you publish that, even though all of the rest of them, all averaged out, show that that result actually isn't true. It could have just been a fluke. Now there's two really easy ways to start solving that. One is just to say that before you do your study, you need to say online to everyone what you're gonna do and how you're gonna publish it. Because if you say you're gonna publish everything that you do, then we won't end up with that weird sampling bias. We won't end up with a lot of unreported studies. And that's one way. We can also just encourage journals and researchers to publish all of their findings. This sounds freaking obvious, but apparently it's not. A lot of journals won't publish results that aren't significant and interesting strictly because, well, they're not interesting. But just because most science is wrong and we can't do it again, we can't reproduce it, doesn't mean it still isn't the best way we have of figuring out how the world works. And it's a process. I mean, we're improving on how we do science. Similarly to improving all of science, I also want to improve these videos. And I can really only do that with your feedback. So if you could like or dislike this video and leave a comment saying what you would like me to do, if, you, if there's something I can do more of or less of to make these videos better, I'd really appreciate that. And if you do like these videos and you want to see more, I'm making videos every week. So please click here to subscribe and thank you so much for watching.